Welcome. Thanks for coming into the session. It's good to see you all. It's been a busy week so far, and we're not even close to done. What's been the most amazing for me has been the number of customers that are talking about bet your business, mission critical applications they've brought up online on AWS this week. I'm just blown away by that, not because we didn't see it coming. I think we all see it coming. The cloud's such an obvious value proposition, that's coming. But these big industry transitions that we're so lucky to be seeing right now are rare. They don't happen often, and they don't happen fast. Slow, slow, slow. It's just hard moving apps. It's just, it takes time. And so when you see something happening at this pace, it's mind boggling. So that's the first thing is, wow, things are really moving along fast right now. Second is, from a, from a theme perspective, what I wanted to cover today is, this is how the cloud actually is different. I've heard, I've heard so many references to, well, this is, is it really different than what we've been doing for the last 40 years? It is. And so what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to start off by talking about scale and defining what scale means today. And the reason I'm going to start with scale is that's the enabler for everything else I'm going to talk about. That's the foundational building block for everything else. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through a spectrum of different technology areas where we're deeply invested, and I'll show you what we're doing to build towards the theme of this really is something different, and also just to show the diversity of the different things we're working on, because I think it's kind of interesting that it's, it's, it's gotten to the point now where we're working on everything from power distribution, server design, network design, the software stacks, all the way up from above that. Everything's open, we can change anything everywhere, and we're changing everything everywhere. It's a fun time. Here's a, a data point, the origin of with which the genesis of this data point is back in 2000, I met Charlie Bell and Rick Delzell, who led the Amazon.com infrastructure team at the time. At, met them at the High Performance Transaction Computing Conference, and they were presenting, here's how Amazon.com worked. It was impressive. That was a high-scale system that was really quite something. And so I was thinking, wouldn't that be an interesting way of showing the rate with which AWS is growing right now? Because I was impressed by the size of AWS back then. That was a, that was a big company doing big things. And it turns out, I was thinking, maybe we do that in three weeks or a month, and that would be an impressive number, because let me, let me tell you, Amazon did not build this in a week or a month. And the mind-boggling thing is it's every day. In fact, it's way bigger than that. It's way bigger than that every day. When, uh, when Amazon was a $7 billion enterprise, if you look at all the compute resources that it had at that time, we bring that online every day. Think about that. What that means is the components have to be ordered from all the component suppliers. The components have to be delivered to the, to the manufacturer. The manufacturer has to build and test the gear. The gear has to be pushed into the logistics channel, shipped all the way to the data center. The truck has to pull up at the back of the data center. The loading dock has to have space on it. The rack has to have a position in our data center. There's got to be power available for the rack. There has to be cooling available for the rack. There has to be networking available for the rack. The service has to provision the rack and make those resources available to customers. And that happens every day. Right now, as we talk, there's teams all around the world doing exactly this. And they're going to do it again tomorrow. And they're going to do it each day on the weekend as well. And it just keeps cranking. This is a different type of scale, at least for me. It's a phenomenal piece of scale. And when I'm talking about the things that, are, that we're doing and some of, some of the areas that we're invested in, think about this number. Because that's what makes it possible. And that's what makes it sane. I mean. It's just, it, it, a lot of these operations require scale in order to, to actually take place. Here's another point of scale. AWS has, a, is a world, has presence worldwide. There's nine regions. Each region is made up of multiple availability zones. Each availability zone is at least one data center. Because we're growing so fast, some availability zones are more than one data center. In fact, some availability zones are more than two data centers. Um, things are moving pretty fast. Let's talk about storage and database. 
Why do I want to talk about storage and database? Well, partly it's my background, but, but more than that, as an industry, we've gotten pretty good, and we kind of know how to deploy stateless applications. If you want a stateless application to be highly available and very scalable, a load balancer across a large number of servers works very well. And it's, I won't call it easy, because in, in our industry, nothing's easy, but it's pretty easy to do. It's pretty easy. The hard part is, any interesting app has state. You have to make sales, show advertising, show transitions, count customers. You've got to do things, and that's where it gets hard. It's the shared state that's the backbreaker of most applications. The reason, why, the reason why system administrators are up at 2 in the morning is usually because storage or database has caused an issue. That's the hard part. And so if you want to say, you know, where is it impressive to scale? It's impressive to scale in storage and database. So let's talk storage and database. When I ran my first transaction processing application back a long, long, long time ago, Scale for us at the time, we were very proud. We produced the world's fastest number at this time in history. The world's fastest number was 69 transactions per second. We were proud. The party was long. It was a big deal. S3 is doing 1.5 million per second from 69. Wow, the industry is moving along. Trillions of objects stored in this. If you wanted to put this worldwide distributed asset all in one data center, you'd need a bigger data center than I've ever seen. It's huge. It's probably the world's biggest data store at this point. Absolutely phenomenal. And what, what it's doing is it removes the complexity of trying to, you know, if you ask me how should I write my application, I'll say make sure your state is stored in at least three data centers. They're all synchronously replicated. And if everything goes wrong anywhere, anything goes wrong anywhere, you'll fail, you'll fail it quickly, get the and bring another one up and da 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 da. And that's how you're gonna get awesome availability. That's how you're gonna get awesome scaling. And you can do it. Tens of people are on the team, but you can do it. S3 just does it for you. It's gone. You don't have to worry about it. You get durability that is un, unmet, unmatched anywhere in the world. You get availability that's phenomenal, and it's serving at this rate. However, you could say to me, that's good, that's good, but database is way harder. Database is way harder. And there's truth to that. Database is hard. One of the ways databases are, scores, are, are scaled is, is NoSQL, NoSQL systems. NoSQL systems take away some of the features of a relational system, and where relational systems that I worked on for years focus on features first, NoSQL systems focus on scale first. And as a consequence, a few things are given up. One really common give up in a NoSQL system is it's eventually consistent. And the reason for that is the cap theorem, and it's complicated, and it's hard to, it's hard to get availability at the same time, da, da, da. So what does eventual consistency mean? Well, if, if you've got a structured store, and you set a value in the structured store to 17, and say it used to be 13, and then you go back and read it, what do you get? Usually, you get 17. If it's an eventually consistent system, it's very probable that you will get 17. If you're in test, you will always get 17. Sometimes you get 13 in production. It makes the app really hard to write. It makes the database much easier to scale. So you know, as a database guy, I would have loved to produce that. But the truth is, it's, it's just a hard application model. 17 becoming 13 is, is, is just depressing. It's just hard to write against. So you can say, hey, I'm smart. I've got a scalable system. I'll update it, and then I'll check to make sure the update actually made it through. So you set it to 17. You go back and read it. You get 17. You're done, right? Not so much. Not so much. Still could get 13 next time. Eventual consistency is hard. So what DynamoDB did, and this is, you know, the reason I'm describing it in that way is I want you to understand, it's hard. It's hard to give really reliable systems that produce very low latency response across, across multiple data centers and provide eventual consistency. Uh, pardon me, provide consistency. Easy to do with, easier to do with eventual consistency. So what the DynamoDB team did is they said, listen, I think it's a hard model. AWS, what we do is we take over complexity. We should do that once in the store, and customers love it. And this is only, this is only a year and a half old system. It's a year and a half old system. Look at the growth. In one region alone, 
In one region alone, it's already, it's already over two trillion requests in a month. And this is a baby. It's, it's only, it hasn't been around two years yet. And why is that happening? Well, because when, if you want and you set and you ask for consistency, when you set it to 17, you go back later, it's 17. It's still 17 if there's a database failure. It's still 17 if there was a, a, a data center failure. It's still seven, it's 17. It's just, it's gonna be 17. That's a much easier model to program against. It's a wildly better place to be. And so what happens is customers use it. It makes it easier to write apps against it so people more write more apps, they write them faster. There's more getting deployed. And so in one region, we're already serving over two trillion um, requests in a month. Big number. I'm proud of the team. I think it's phenomenal. Second thing I'm, I'm really imp impressed with the team for is when you see big growth, when you see fast growth, you learn about architecture. And what I mean by that is that if there's architectural errors or mistakes made in the application and they're unlucky enough that customers decide to use them in a big way, there's lots of outages. There's just lots of pain. And the reason why you haven't been hearing a ton about DynamoDB is because it's super reliable. Rock solid, never down, just cranking every day. That's what you want. So it means they got, the, they got the product right from an architectural perspective. The next thing you ask about is, well, sure, you can do all that, but can you, you need to have low latency. Every study I've ever read from Google and from Microsoft and from Amazon says low latency sells more product, low latency get, gets more use, low latency has more customer engagement. Low latency is a wonderful thing. In fact, low latency is more important than most customers understand. And so DynamoDB signed up for single digit millisecond latency. But latency is good, but it's not quite enough. If you're a really mature app developer, you know it's not just latency. It's not just latency, it's stability of the latency. You want it the same all the time. You want, it's, it's again, much easier if it's usually three milliseconds but rarely 39 milliseconds. It makes it easier to write. There's lots of reasons why that happens. You could be having a garbage collection. There could be new row allocation. Who knows? I mean, it's just, there's so many reasons to add jitter to a software product. Nailing it like this is hard. This is the first week of this month, and this is the latency numbers for the first week of this month in the same region. It's boring. It never changes. And if we chose, that's the first week. If we chose the second week, just change, the, just change the, the labels on the bottom of the screen. It's the same chart. It just sits there. And it's always the same. And it's the same when, when a customer says, is James telling me stories? Can I really scale the way he says? And so what do you, so what do, you do? You test it, right? And so during that run, I guarantee you, hundreds of, probably thousands of customers tested it at insane scale because it's very inexpensive and because they're not going to trust us until they try it. So people are trying very high scale runs all the time and it still stays the same. It's a wonderful place to be. Here's one that's fun. It's, it's fun for the, the first reason it's fun is, is it, it's nice to see AWS recognized. Completeness of vision, very high, right hand side of the screen, that's a good thing. The one that's important to me is execution. I've always said that ideas are cheap. It's not quite true, but executing actually is the hard part. Being able to actually get the job done rather than just knowing what you'd like to do is, is really the hard part of engineering. So it's a sign of respect that that's a high number as well. I like seeing that. The one I really like, though, is the customer metric. And that is, look at this one. Look at this one. This says, if you take the 15 IAS providers, the 15 top providers, Take 14 of them in aggregate, AWS is five times bigger than those 14. Think what that means. That means that 80% of the customers that are wisely moving to the cloud in the same rush that I talked about earlier, 80% are saying, I'm going to have to trust one of these providers to do an awesome job, to give me low latency results, to take care of my data, to keep me secure, to keep me employed, and they bet on Amazon. We appreciate your contribution. I appreciate your contribution to that number. Thank you for your, thank you for your trust in us, and be, rest assured, we take it super seriously. We are unbelievably focused on making sure that no one's disappointed. 
Let's look at some of the things that are going on right now in, in EWS and see if we can build that theme that convince you, convinces you that this really is different than, the, than, the, than some of the IT systems you've been involved with. First, let's look at just a, a, tra a, ch um, a change that's happening in the industry. The change looks like this. I've seen more innovation in the last five years than I saw in the previous 20. That's a surprising change. Why is that? It's, the reason is infrastructure used to be a cost center. Infrastructure used to be something we build cars. Of course, we have a very important IT shop. And of course, it really is important. I mean, it's, it's vital, absolutely vital to the business. But it's not the core business. It's, it, they build cars. They, build, they sell insurance. They um, do oil exploration. All IT shops, super important. But it's not the focus. For AWS, the difference between, because, well, first of all, the cost of, de of deploying a service is all infrastructure. At scale, the engineering costs, if you want to tell the software folks this, the infrastructure, the, the, those costs round to zero. The cost is all in the infrastructure. It's all in the infrastructure. And so the difference between AWS being an anchor around the neck of Amazon shareholders and absolutely going to drag the company down versus a group that's capable of reducing prices 38 times, reinvesting in the business, and cranking features out every day, the difference between those two points of the spectrum all comes down to the cost of the infrastructure. It it's, it's all comes down to the cost of the infrastructure. And what that means is we focus 100% of our resources on that. All of our leaders are staring at that problem. All of our engineers are focused on that problem. And what happens when you have a really, really focused problem where if you do not get it right, you actually will not have a successful business? It works. It drives up the pace of innovation that's phenomenally higher. Another thing that makes the pace of innovation higher is we, we do more. And if you build many data centers a year versus build two in your life, you get better at it. More than that, if you're going to put $200 million at risk, you're going to be cautious. You don't going to get many opportunities. You're going to be very cautious. And so you have long cycle times, very risk averse, means slow pace of innovation. The best thing you can do for innovation is drive the risk of failure down and make the cycle quick. That's how you make developers more productive. That's how you, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it applies everywhere. Well, it's this, and in fact, it's the same. It's one of the most important value, uh, one of the important, most important values of a cloud service is it allows you to test ideas more quickly. It allows you to very inexpensively try new things out. And what happens is, pace of innovation is higher. Custom server designs. Why would we design our own servers? It's Especially, why would, why would I be involved with designing our own servers when I've argued for years, a decade ago, that you don't want to be doing one custom server for each workload. That's crazy. What you want is a small number of standardized server SKUs and then all the magics in software. So general purpose server SKUs, all the optimization in software. That's the way you should do it. And that is the way you should have do it 10 years ago. But now, when you have tens of thousands of servers, tens of thousands of servers that are all doing exactly the same thing, you have to optimize in the hardware. You'd be, you'd be stealing from your customers not to optimize in the hardware. It's crazy when you have tens of thousands doing the same thing to not specialize the server for doing that thing and doing it very well. And so that's why we're invested in it. Second reason we're invested in it is the server ecosystem is designed for a different, a different model. Server companies have big distribution channels. They ship to distributors, and distributors ship to retailers, and retailers or ISVs and IHVs sell to customers. And the problem with that is, it, well, the good thing about that is that's the only way you can reach tens of thousands of customers. That's the only efficient way to meet, ten, meet tens of thousands of customers. But it costs 30%. So every server that flows through that channel is 30% more expensive. And there's nothing you can do. That is the truth. When you turn the equation on its head and say, listen, instead of having tens of thousands of servers, we're going to have one 
tens of thousands of customers, pardon me, we're going to have one customer, suddenly you don't need those distribution channels. It's just, you talk directly to the manufacturer every day. It's, that's, that's, of course you would. And because you can do that, it does a couple things that are important. One is, it takes 30% off the top right away. And so if you say, listen, private cloud, public cloud, what's the difference? 30% off the top right there. It's done. No brains. You didn't do anything. Not the important thing, though. The important thing is you're talking to the component manufacturers and the server manufacturers directly all the time. And what that means is ideas are getting cranked more quickly. We're trying things. The pace of innovation's higher. The communication backwards is much better. That, those, 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 those deep distribution channels don't communicate well. It's not in everyone's interest to tell exactly what every customer wants to the manufacturer. It's, it's just not in their best interest to do that. So it doesn't happen. And whenever you don't have good communications, you don't have this, it slows down innovation. So it makes sense economically to operate this way, and it makes sense um, from a pace of innovation perspective as well. Here's another one, storage. If you ever wonder, how could the storage be as inexpensive as it is? I remember when S3 came out, many of us, the blog, were, 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 were trying to do the math, saying, is that even possible? Could you possibly ever make money at that? I mean, how is that possible? Well, one of the ways it's possible is custom storage designs. And I can't show you our custom storage designs. At least I can't today. I'd love to. I wanted to. So what I did instead is I looked for the best storage design I could find out there in the industry today. Who's doing the densest storage out there today? And what I found is in a 4U package, you can get 60 high-capacity disk drives today. 60 in 4U. That's over 600 in a standard 19-inch rack. That's, that's about three quarters of, of a ton of disk if you're buying by the ton. <laughs> and if you're moving the rack, be careful, because it really is three quarters of a ton. We're not using this. And the reason we're not using it is we have a far denser design. And it is more than a ton. <sighs> not to give you exact numbers. That's how we get, that's one of the ways we drive efficiency. Here's another one I do. Um, I've, about every year, 18 months, I go and compute what does it cost to run a service. And what I'm looking at is the cost of the data center, the cost of the power, the cost of the network, the cost of the servers, the cost of everything below the operating system. So everything from the open source OS right downwards, that everything is, is included in that. And it, all, it, it produces interesting numbers. Um, we could talk about this from a variety of different perspectives because the data is actually pretty useful. What I use it for is, I use it, when I, I use it to spot problems. Whenever a number looks bigger than it, is, than it should be, it probably is. And so this motivates a lot of the work that I end up doing. Sometimes what happens, though, it's the, it's, it's the rate of change that's interesting. In this particular one, if you look at it, you see network is about 8% of the overall cost. Eh, it's not that much. It's really, it's not that bad. And so you, it kind of argues, don't worry about it. But then if you look at the last time you cranked the numbers, you say, wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a sec. If you look at the ratio of overall, all the servers, networking, and everything, the server cost is going down very rapidly. The networking cost is frozen in time. It's just sitting there. It never changes. It never gets smaller. And what, hap what that means is the cost, the ratio of the costs that are going to be networking are skyrocketing. So that right away you know you've got a problem, and so that's why we're focused on networking costs. One more reason. Another thing happening, at the same time that networking is becoming an ever-increasing ratio of the overall cost, at the same time that's happening, usage patterns are changing. If you take a classic retail um, workload or, a or an internet search workload, what you'd see is request comes in, branches out, heads out to tens, hundreds, even thousands of servers, and then comes back up again and returns a result to the customer. That's a classic north-south flow in a network. And it turns out oversubscribed networks work really well in that workload, in that pattern, because all the servers are never transmitting at all at the same time. And so to have an oversubscription ratio of 60 or even 100 to 1 is pretty common. And what that means is that only 1 60th of all the servers could be transmitting at full bandwidth at any one point in time. And it works fine. And because networking is so ridiculously expensive, 
people end up with oversubscription levels at, at, as high as 100 to 1. The problem with that is if you're running a data analytics workload or MapReduce or, or anything of that nature, the odds of all the servers transmitting at full bandwidth at any one point in time are just about 100%. Just about 100%. And the oversubscribed network works unbelievably badly in that environment. So you've got two problems now. You've got a ratio of expense on networking is skyrocketing. And then you have the second problem is the amount of networking gear that you're going to need if you really want to serve your customers properly is going up by a factor of 100. As soon as you have a couple orders of magnitude and a cost problem, you've got to invest in it. So what this caused, what this caused us to do is we build our own networking hardware now, and we have our own protocol stack. And the first thing, the obvious thing that comes from that is we're now, the, the price point is phenomenally changed. But even more important, we're now on the right, we're now on the right pa glide path. It now is on a Moore's Law path. The ASIC that forms the heart of one of, 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 one of these routers is, is always about the same price. And when I first started playing with these, there was 24 ports. And then there was 48 ports. And now there's 64 ports. And 96 is, very, is just around the corner. And they're all around the same price. And so now networking gear is actually declining in cost. The right thing's happening. And what that allows us to do is we can now provision very high performance networks. You will have seen this year big changes in our network. And next year, even bigger are planned. And the reason is we've taken over the network. Suddenly, we can do what we, what we normally do. Another beautiful thing about the network being owned by us is we've gotten pretty good operationally over the years, and every metric is tracked across every service, and Andy Jassy will see it every week. It's, it gets a lot of focus. If there's a problem in one of our services, it will probably be fixed the next day. Action happens quickly. Well, if you have to call a vendor and say we've got this problem, and they have to try to reproduce it in their lab, and, and then they have to try to figure out what went wrong in their 10 billion lines of software with all of these features that nobody wants, then they have to actually fix it and take it through their tests of the 10 billion features, at least half of which actually get tested, and then ship it out to us, and, and we deploy it so customers can enjoy having that fix. And what happens is, if you're very, 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 very influential and convincing, and we're pretty good, it'll take a few months. Now we can do it in a day. Now we can actually go down and talk to someone that works on the protocol stack every day and say, listen, this is what we saw. The, the switch is still there. It's still, you know, it's, go look at it. And, and we just, you know, the, the, tr the turnaround on being able to fix problems is, is fundamentally better. And so pace of innovation is better, cost is better, we're on the right first derivative for price, and we, and we can turn things around more quickly. Here's one that I'm surprised to be able to, to talk to you about. Um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's surprising for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons it's surprising is you, you, you wouldn't think that this would be a place of innovation where it would really make a big difference. What this is, is the way power distribution works in, 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 is generators produce power. Power gets stepped up to several hundred thousand volts for distribution. It, it travels long distances at several hundred thousand volts, and then it's stepped down at a substation to mid-voltage, which is 13,000 volts, and then 13,000 in North America is stepped down to around 480 for delivery into the data center. Well, so that's the conventional way it works. And you say, why would you want to do your own substation? Substation is, first of all, it's a very high scale entity. Substation is 50 megawatts to 100 megawatts to be efficient. And so the first is they're big. This is a minimum 50 megawatt facility. Second, second thing that's notable about it is <clears throat> the ones we're involved with take 115,000 volts in, produce 12,700 or 13,200, something in that range. Mid voltage is on the way out. Can you really do enough innovation in there to be actually worth having power engineers that are on staff that do nothing but design these things? You'd think not, because how often do you need 50 megawatts? I mean, I told you about pretty phenomenal growth. 50 megawatts is, that's a lot of servers. <laughs> that's, a, that's, a, that's many, many tens of thousands of servers. So you wouldn't need it often. But there's two reasons why we do it. The first reason is, and it's, it's relevant, it's not 
this is a small portion of what it costs to host, to, to host a service is, is in a substation. It's a tiny portion of the cost. It's a lot of money, but you know, it's, spread over a, you know, it's spread over a large number of, of services, and so it's, it's a small proportion of the overall cost. But there is a significant cost savings. The reason we do it, though, is, is cycle time. It takes two years in most jurisdictions to get a new substation. At the rate we're growing, if we had to wait two years, we'd have to tell you, I'm sorry, we don't have capacity to support your, your needs. We're not going to do that. And so the main reason why we're doing this is to allow us to reliable, ha reliably have capacity and to be able to grow at phenomenal paces. And we can do it way, way better than twice as fast um, in, most, in most situations. And so that's why we choose to invest in, in the engineering resources in, in building substations. I will argue that that's something that's not usually done in most enterprise IT shops and might be different in the cloud. Here's another one. Sitting, sitting around watching the Super Bowl last year, the lights went out for 34 minutes. I love, as, as anyone that reads my blog knows, I love understanding failures and understanding what went wrong and what can we learn from it. Because every failure has a lesson to be learned behind it and they're all worth looking at. So this one, if you look deeper, what happened is the switchgear sensed an anomaly, which probably means, um, probably means um, uh, short or ground fault or, or something like that in the system. It operated as designed and, 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 and isolated, and, and isolated the, the facility. So that's, that's a good thing. And it turns out I know, ex I know this problem super well. I've seen it in data centers, exactly the same thing. The way it looks in a data center, it's the same problem. Here's how it looks. It's, it's really depressing. It looks like this. First, the utility has some bad event. Maybe, maybe a, a, a power pole gets hit by a car. Some, something bad happens out there. The switch gear gets an unbelievably big surge and says there's probably a ground fault in the data center. So the switch gear, first of all, takes a, pops the load, which is probably fine because the utility is, is in deep trouble already. So it's pro that's probably not, that's fine. Unfortunately, it also does not bring the generator online. And that's where it gets depressing because the uninterruptible power supplies are ticking down, the generator's running, and it's not gonna get brought onto the load. And so in about Mm, five, ten minutes, something like that, all the servers are starting to go black. That's just the way it's going to play out. We know this problem. Why would the switchgear be designed to do that? People aren't crazy. Why is the switchgear designed like that? And the reason is, their goal is to protect the gear. If you bring a generator into a direct ground fault, you will probably lose a $600,000 generator. It will be three quarters of a million dollars will disappear really quickly after that. That's not good from a lawsuit perspective, from a, from a manufacturer, um, and most customers would never want that to happen. And so what the switchgear's design point is, their goal, and it's written correctly, is protect the resources. Our goal is to keep the servers running. So we, what do we do? We hire switchgear firmware engineers, which is an arcane programming language that doesn't look at all like Java, and, <laughs> and we don't write that goal. We write to a different goal. Our goal is keep the load running. And it turns out the generators are fine. There is a stack of breakers all in the data center where there's, there's breakers at the branch circuit level, there's breakers at the RPDU level, there's breakers, there's breakers up and down the stack. Um, there's, um, from, so our goal when we write this switchgear firmware is hold the load. That's, that's our number one goal, and it's different. And it, you know, the reason why we have switchgear that's different than the rest of the world is because our goals are different. It, just, it makes total sense. This, is, this doesn't save us any money. You know, it doesn't save us any money to do this, but it's a little bit more available. And when I say a little bit more available, never in the history of the Super Bowl has there been 34 minutes outage from, from a power issue. This switchgear problem has never happened. And you know something else? For the rest of my life, it'll probably never happen again. This is super unusual. Switchgear very, very, very rarely locks out. It's a very rare event. So why the heck do we invest in it? Because if you're big and you operate at extreme scale, rare events can happen. 
And in fact, rare events start to become common if you get sufficiently large. And so it's worth doing it for our perspective. And we think it's the right goal, and we think it's the right investment. And what I like about it is it does a little bit of an improvement on availability, and it shows our stubbornness to grind away at any problem. You know, the fact that switch gear programs can't be changed, and they're highly proprietary, and switch, gears would, switch gear manufacturers would never let you see their code, and they'd sure as heck never let you change it, doesn't discourage us. We, we'll negotiate with them, and we get access to it, and we do what, what I just told you. So it, it, another thing I like about it is it shows a stubbornness to follow through and really solve problems. Here's another one. Carbon neutral power choice. For companies that rarely build data centers, if you built your data center in one location because it's close to headquarters, or it's, or it's close to your customers, or it's close to something that you like, well, you'll get that res the result that you want. But the problem is, what if your goals change? What if you made a corporate mandate that I want to be carbon neutral by 2015? Well, you can't move the data center. It just, it's just not practical. And um, it's, it's hard to do. If you're running an AWS, what you do is you say, OK, that, that's, that's, that's the goal. I'll put my resources in US, in US West Oregon. 100% carbon neutral. Done. It's, and and we can, you know, the reason why we offer that, 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 that alternative is because we can. Some customers want it, and it, it's, it, it's an asset. It's, it's customers want it. So interesting thing, kind of happy about it. It's already one of our largest regions. Those of, those of you that work with AWS quite a bit know that it's a relatively re, uh, new region. It's already um, one, of our, one of our largest region, regions worldwide. In fact, it's, it's, the second, it's the second highest use region yet that we have, and it's the fastest growing. Who would ever guess that in a talk about innovation and what's really different and what's really exciting and where the technology is hot would include something on procurement and supply chain management? Never really been my idea of the hottest area out there. However, at scale, everything gets interesting. And it turns out you can do amazing things here if you invest software in it. And every problem to us translates to software. Somewhere, it becomes a software problem. And for us, the way software can help here is when you're growing at the rate that we're growing, it's super hard to, to figure out when a new data center has to be brought online, when new fiber needs to be lit up, when new server orders need to go in. It's really hard to do that. Having software systems that are good at figuring out when those decisions need to be made and making them all as late as possible saves a lot of money. And the reason for that is, if, you have to predict, if your data center build time is two years, you need to see two years into the future. I don't know about you, but two years in the future, I have no idea what the world will look like. I haven't a clue. If you have to look one month into the future, we actually have a pretty good idea. And so the reason why these systems are important is, first of all, it's helping us have a shorter cycle time. Second reason it's important is it allows us to reliably deliver resources and never run out. And I guess the final reason it's, 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 it's important is if, you don't, if, you, if you're buying precisely, then you don't have to have as much headroom, and so you don't have all of these resources lying fallow in the data center with cost but not delivering any value. When we're, talking about the, when we're talking about the economics of hosting servers, when we're talking about, even when we're talking about the environment, the elephant in the room is always, is always utilization. Because we can talk all we want about making a server 5% more efficient. It's a good thing to do. We do it all the time. It's important work. But the problem is, across the industry, utilization levels of 30% would make you famous. Nobody achieves numbers as big as 30%. And the truth is, somewhere in the 10 to 20 range is really, really common. And if you turn that number around and say, how much of that server is wasted, the, the answer is roughly 80%. 80% of the power distribution equipment, the data center space, the cooling systems, the servers, 80% of all the resources that are needed to host a workload don't do any good. And you can say, oh, I'll be smart. I'll just turn them, I'll turn them off. OK, you turn them off. Now you save you know, 8%. Big deal. I mean, it's good. I mean, nothing wrong with it. But the problem is low utilization is, is wasting most of the resources that were purchased. You've got a couple hundred million dollar room with 
building with, a, with, a, with two or three hundred million dollars of the servers doing nothing. It's just nuts. And so anything that can change this number, even microscopically, is, is worth a lot of money. Because it, it's, if you can take a number from 15% to 20%, what you're doing is, that's if you look at the cost of the entire, the entire infrastructure, that's a 5% improvement right there. It's across the board, uh, multiplied times the whole, everything. It's a phenomenal, it's by far the most powerful lever of lowering costs is raising utilization. And this is another one of those cases where the cloud just cheats. It's just, without doing anything, we get advantages. So let's look at this. If you think about utilization, you have to pay for the peak, right? You've got to have the gear to cover the peak, but, you won't, and, but as the workload goes up and down, you're paying for the peak all the time, but you're monetizing the average. So paying for the peak, monetizing the, monetizing the average. The bigger the spread between the peak and the average, the, the, the more expensive the workload is to host. If you take a large number of non-correlated sinusoidal workload patterns and overlay them, you'll get a flatter, it, it flattens out. They tend to average each other out. And it sort of makes sense if you think about it. Tax preparation software is really only, only busy one time in the year. Retail workloads tend to be really big at one time of the year. And so if you combine workloads that are diverse and non-correlated, you'll get, without doing anything, without thinking hard, without being you know, super innovative, without filing patents, it just gets better. It, and it gets better in a powerful way. Because even 10% better is an unbelievably big number. And so you, say, so you think about that and say, well, that's, that's, that's pretty good. Is there more we can do? Because that's still not flat. And if it's not flat, you can't be happy because it's the most powerful level that there is. You've got to keep pulling. And, and so there's one more thing we can do. And that is, you've still got resources that are unsold. If you go back to that chart I showed earlier that plotted the price of everything, it tells you something else that's super interesting. It tells you that if you can find a workload that's worth more than the marginal cost of power, it's profitable to run it. Because the server's already paid for. So if you, anything, your only choice is either shut it off or find something to run on it. Anything that's worth more than the marginal cost of power is a profit to run. And so we steal an idea from the financial market, and that's what a spot instance is. We make a market. In order to make a market, you need a large number of diverse customers. That's how you make a market. You, know, you need to have some fluidity to the market. So if you have a large number of customers, and say, what would you be willing to pay me for an hour's worth of server? And they, they'll bid low because, hey, you know, it's... It's, if, I, if, if I was going to pay you what, what, it, what it was worth, I would have just paid you what it was worth. So they bid low, and they get a wonderful deal. They get an awesome deal. They're, they could be paying less than cost. They could be paying less than the cost of server. Unbelievably good for customers. And it's good for us, because it's more than the marginal cost of power. And so we're happy, too. And it's good for the environment, because all those resources are actually being used. And so when you hear about people shutting off servers, eh, Unfortunate. It's just, it's, it's, it's not, it, it won't make, it doesn't move the needle. It doesn't help. I mean, it, it, it's, it, certainly you should do it if you can't do the tricks I'm talking about. But this is another area where, look at this and say, is the cloud different? Well, if you're a single company, you can only combine the workloads of a single company. And it's hard to make a market over, over a single customer. This is another place where the cloud just is inherently more efficient. And without being super smart, and without spending a ton of time on innovation, it just gets better as a consequence of, of combining non-correlated workloads. Amazon's cycle of innovation. This is a fun one. I've worked in server software. I've worked in enterprise software systems or in, for my entire life. All I do is, is, is scaling. And if you work on scaling and, and, and driving down costs and improving reliability, that's what you work on. And in all those years, do you know how many price reductions I've seen? Do you know how often an enterprise software says, software company or hardware company says, gosh, we should just drop the prices? It's just, it's, it, it doesn't happen. And the wild thing of being at Amazon is I've seen us drop the prices when there was zero competitive pressure. It's, it's just, it's, un, it, it's previously unthinkable. And it's a wonderful place to be, because we think it's the right thing for customers, and we actually think it's the right thing for, for, for the business. We think it's good. And so 
the way we work is we get, we, we get an idea that probably came from customers because they said we could really use help in this area. So we talked about storage. So out comes a new storage product, maybe Redshift. Customers say, we like it. We think Redshift is a good product. It's solving problems for me. But I wish you had this feature. We're listening. 26 features shipped last year on Redshift because we just keep working and working and working. Customers keep telling us what they, what, what they want. We keep, we keep making those changes to the product. Because there's a large number of customers, we can have a fairly substantial engineering investment in that, and the features just keep cranking. And as we get better at, at, at running these services, we run them more efficiently. It's not a surprise. I mean, of course you get better at things as you do it more, and as we get better, our prices fall, and so we actually pass those costs on to users. Maybe we get enough scale that justifies hardware specialization for the, for the product, in which case, again, we get a cost reduction and pass it on to customers. We think it's the right way to work, and it's one of the ways the cloud's fundamentally different. Talked about features and reinvesting in the business. Look at the, this is the rate of features that, that AWS is shipping right now. And it's, it's, it's an important number because when, you, when you're picking a cloud vendor, you really you want to know that they're going to continue to reinvest in the business. They're going to keep making more features. They're going to keep making it easier to write software on it. They're going to they're going to stay competitive or stay leading. And so we're proud of this number. We think we think it's actually pretty hard to do, and we think this is potentially different from um, from from the way most IT shops work as well. We're able to drive a little faster, a lot faster pace of innovation, and think we could deliver value more quickly. It's another one of those ways where the cloud's a little different. Here's one that I like. Um, I focus a lot on availability, and it's really hard to, to, to be personally responsible and, and care deeply about availability. And, and, and to feel a real obligation to our customers who have trusted us with their workloads. It, it's really hard to see, oh, there was an outage. You just never, ever, ever like to see that happen. And I'm super proud of the results that, that, that we get, and both from an operational excellence perspective, from a um, driving bugs out of hardware, driving bugs out of software. I'm really happy with the results that we're getting. But is it good enough? It's never good enough. And so I love the fact that, that a large number of customers that were recently surveyed said, listen, I went to AWS. My availability went up by 32%. It's nice to see. I think it, it, I think it kind of makes sense, if you think about it, because what we do is we run very large scale systems, which means we, we have to automate them. Well, most customers don't autom can't afford to automate them because they only have three of these systems. We have 10,000 or some ridiculous number. So you have to automate it. You couldn't hire enough people to take care of the system any other way. So you're forced to automate, which means it, it's, it, it's more reliable. People make much mistakes roughly 20% of the time if they're doing things manually. Um, so first, you know, first of all, it's, it's lower cost. Second of all, it's more, it's more available. And, and, and third, we monitor the heck out of them. And we have rules around, around AWS that if we ever give a customer a bad day, it better show up in the metrics. And so what it means is we're learning with our metrics all the time, where, where if there's any issue with any of our services, it has to show in the metric, or we find a metric that could have tracked that. And that means we're getting better all the time. And because we're watching these metrics, we, can, we have them, we can alert on them directly, and we can respond more quickly. And our goal is we see issues before customers see issues. It makes sense. And if you're investing in things deeply because, you, because you, the scale's there, it kind of makes sense that you, it, you ought to get a better result. It just seems natural. One more. We're looking again at is hosting on-premise, if you get really big, is it less expensive? Couple observations. First, we've talked a bit about scale, and so we know that really big is actually, it's really big. Like, it's really big. Second is, we went through a, we went through a bunch of innovations, all of which take costs out of the system that would make it un, surprising if it would be less expensive. We talked about the distribution channel that comes from enter, big enterprise equipment providers that is expensive, that puts a 30% adder on there. Again, you've got to pay that because there's tens of thousands of customers. We don't. So 
it seems like it would, be, it would be hard to get it less expensive at that point. Just the math doesn't seem to play out well. And then you've got the public record to look at. All big enterprise software companies are publicly held. You can go and look and say, what is their profit margin? And I just, for the heck of it, went and pulled, a, and pulled uh, four that sprung to my mind quickly. And it's almost funny, because of course you get the result exactly that you expect to get, and that is they're very profitable companies because they're, they're working in a very profitable industry that's been around for a very long time, and that's, the way it's, that's just the way it's been done. And then you look at the Amazon numbers, and you think, well, of course, they're making zero money. There's, new, there's analysts that still won't recommend Amazon.com as a buy. That's just the way it's going to be, because they just don't see the profit. We're super comfortable with that. That's the way the company has run forever. It's absolutely not a problem. And we think the cloud computing market looks exactly the same way. And that is, it's a very high volume, very high volume market with very low margins. And we think it's the best thing for customers. We think it's absolutely the best thing for, for the company as well. And so that's the way we work. That's our DNA. And it really is different from how any enterprise company that I've had the pleasure of working for in the past works. Okay, summary. We talked a lot on the economics. We've talked a lot about, about innovations where I've tried to sample ac across different areas of, that were working and tried to conclude the cloud really is fundamentally different. Even though just about everything is labeled cloud these days. I've enjoyed talking to you. If you have questions, I'd love to field them. I'd um, love to talk about just about anything that you're interested in talking about and that's related to infrastructure. If there's questions.